Uh, well, I was raised in Niagara Falls. My grade two teacher said I would never graduate from high school uh, because I had bad penmanship and bad spelling. And I asked dumb questions. I asked my mom an example of a dumb question. She said, well, he, um, he used to ask questions like, in the middle of a math class, if, why is there snow on the top of mountains? Because it's closer to the sun. You know, stuff like that. Um, and uh, I was raised in a small town in Ontario, Canada. And uh, when I graduated from university, I became a uh, radical. I was involved in all kinds of social change movements. Uh, I was fighting for civil rights, against the war in Vietnam, uh, for women's rights. And um, after doing that for a number of years, I decided the revolution is going to come a little more slowly than I had thought. So I decided to get a job. And um, I, the reason I'm in this whole world of information technology, it was a whole fluke, really. I, I had arrived in Toronto, I was unemployed, I had no money, no, uh, nowhere to live, uh, no car, no job, and um, my brother was a headhunter, and he um, got me this opportunity at Bell Northern Research, which is Canada's Bell Labs, to be the head of a group called the Office of the Future. And I, I wondered, what, what is that? And he said, well, it's got something to do with computers going to change the way people work. And um, so I went and I did the first interview and no one really seemed to know what it was and I thought this job is perfect for me because it's always in the future. No one can ever say if you're wrong. And um, I got through a series of interviews and finally they said we want you to talk to a systems engineer final interview. And I said why? And they said well we want to know what you know about the Unix operating system and system development methodologies and and, um, and uh, local area networks and so on. This is like in the late 1970s. And I thought, well, I'm toast. I walked in and there was this tall guy standing there, hair out to here. He was wearing sandals and a jean shirt. And he had this wild genius look in his eye. And he, he looked at me and he said, Don Tapscott, did you go to Camp Wasabin in 1961? And I said, yeah, I did. He says. David Tilbrook, cabin two. <laughs> so that's how, <laughs> that's why I, I got involved. And, and in the late 1970s, uh, we were trying to figure out how the internet would change the world. That was like 20 years before anyone else was thinking about it. Well, I've, I've always had this thing about living a principled uh, and consequential life. And I'm convinced that this is a time of great change. I always have been. But now, um, many of my ideas that I wrote about 30 years ago are ideas whose time has finally come, I think. And uh, I'm convinced that the world is deeply broken and that we're not just in some kind of aftermath of a financial industry meltdown. We're at a turning point in human history. and. Um, where we need to rebuild most of the institutions of industrial capitalism around a new set of uh, principles and around a new communications medium. I wish it were true that we're free from fear, but I think that many of the leaders of our institutions, I think particularly in the United States, um, function on the basis of fear and they create great crises um, and cause us to change our behavior out of fear. And uh, this is a very dangerous thing. I mean, it almost led to the, the collapse of the American economy that um, through the whole um, the raising of the debt ceiling crisis and so on. And we fear terrorists. You know, we fear, and we fear all kinds of things that statistically we shouldn't fear. You know, what we should fear is driving in cars not flying in airplanes, you know. Um, and we also fear what we don't understand as well. I mean, just this great unease that people have with this new generation, you know, the, the I've called digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. Well, um, you know, that we fear that this generation is 
somehow net addicted and glued to the screen and losing their social skills. And the internet is eating the neocortex of youth today. And, and um, they're, they're a generation that don't give a damn, a generation of narcissists and so on. And, and what's going on, I think, is that we've always been uneasy about young people. I mean, children are to be seen and not heard. Uh, youth is wasted on the young. I mean, this is part of our sort of culture. But you combine that with this is the first time in human history when children are an authority about something really important. You know, I, I was an authority on model trains when I was 11, and today the 11 year old is an authority on, on this digital revolution that's changing every institution in society. So when the kids in the schools know more than their teachers about the biggest innovation in learning, and, and they have access to knowledge that's far beyond what the teacher has, when the, when the kids in the home know more about this big innovation that's changing the family than their parents, when kids coming into the workforce have better tools than exist in our most sophisticated companies, I mean, this is a formula for fear. Um, but I love the idea that we need to overcome these fears if we're going to be able to move forward. Well, kids today can multitask. It's actually not multitasking. They have better active working memory and better switching abilities. But I'm kind of old fashioned. I mean, when I'm talking to my daughter, I, I know full well that she can be checking her, her iPhone or Blackberry or whatever and still talking to me. But I've requested of her, I want you to just look me in the eye when you're talking to her. Do it for me, okay? Uh, not for you. And this is a time when, you, you think this has all happened in the last decade. Um, not just the web, but the rise of mobility and these Uber gadgets that connect us all the time. And I think it'll take time for us as individuals and, and as a society to understand how are we going to use this technology and integrate it into our lives so that we not only have more productive lives, but we have better lives and richer um, communications between people. Um, I'm not of the view that this is all a big disaster. It's not. It's a wonderful thing overall, but sure, there are going to be some, some bumps along the way that we need to, to figure out. I mean, here's one. Given what we know about neuroplasticity, that brains can change, and especially for young people, extended adolescence, age 18, a third of your brain is being built, how you spend your time is the main variable determining what your brain is like. So are we moving into a period where we need to sort of design our brains and design our minds? I've, I find myself being able to scan through a whole bunch of uh, headlines of newspapers and, and uh, online uh, information really easily. And I found myself rarely actually reading the whole article. I now form, force myself every day to read at least a couple of articles from beginning to end. And it's not because necessarily I think I'm going to learn something that I might not have learned from the scan, although I often do. But it's more I'm just forcing myself to concentrate on something. And um, the same thing is true in terms of how we, we interact with each other. That, um, you know, when I toast someone, with a glass of wine, eye contact is important. Well, the same thing is important to me in face-to-face -face situations. Well, this was sort of a joke way back. I used to call it Nixon's Law. Everything is connected to everything else. But now it's really true. <laughs> um, if you think about just the global economic crisis, increasingly businesses are starting to conclude that that business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And, uh, you know, the modus operandi of Wall Street has remained unchanged. And I think a lot of bankers thought, well, we'll just get back to normal. That's not going to work. We need to make very deep changes to our entire financial services industry and to, to many other industries. Everything's connected in some new ways, too. That I remember being at Davos and listening to many years ago, listening to Hillary Clinton give a speech 
about the three pillars of society. And she talked about the private sector and companies, the public sector and governments, and the civil society, the not-for-profits and trade unions and so on, and how these three need to work together. Well, there's a new one now. There's a fourth kid on the block, and that's the individual. I think an individual or groups of individuals outside of the boundaries of traditional organizations can be pillars of society. They can create an encyclopedia or a couple of kids in Boston on the Ushahidi network after the Haitian earthquake can save the lives of a seven-year-old girl buried in the rubble in Haiti by going onto Ushahidi, finding her location, translating her calls for help from Creole to English, informing the authorities they went in and they saved her life. They're pillars of society. So now the internet not only drops transaction and collaboration costs in business, it drops the costs of transactions and collaboration in all aspects of most aspects of human existence. And that means that increasingly we are interconnected. And we're, we're, we're interconnected in the sense, too, that, I mean, we have a fragile planet. And if we continue the way we're going, it's very clear that, that human existence at some point will come to an end. I mean, you know, at, again, at, at Davos uh, last year, Bill Clinton was saying to a group of us, if we, if we reduce carbon emissions by 80% in the year 2050, it'll take a thousand years for the planet to cool down. And in the meantime, some bad things are going to happen. You can expect a billion and a half people to lose half of their water supply over the next 10 to 20 years. You know what? That affects us. Haiti is not a, a disaster for Haiti. It's a global problem that we all need to deal with. And I, I guess we're all connected in a new kind of way, too, that we now have a global economy. We used to have national economies. That's what came out of industrial capitalism, the nation state. You've, we created these, uh, these national economies, put a boundary around them, had a language and the rule of law and institutions of government and, and foreign policy and a military and all the rest. It was a good idea, nation states for national economies, except for this little detail today that increasingly we have a, a global economy or we have regional economies like Europe. Latin America, North America, and so on, um, the Pacific Rim. So the nation state's kind of like the wrong size, if you like, for solving a lot of these global problems. And we have all these, these global institutions that came out of the Second World War. Um, right, right after the Second World War, the leaders got together at Bretton Woods. They uh, launched the Marshall Plan. and. Eventually they created all these global institutions like the United Nations and the Global Agreement on Trades and Tariffs and the, the, eventually the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the IMF. Increasingly these institutions are inadequate to solve global problems. On the other hand, we've got these um, sparkling new initiatives of all kinds of network-based cooperations of these different pillars of society working together to solve global problems in radical new ways. And, and so, if anything, I, this is a time of great opportunity. It's a, I'm, I'm ne I've never been more worried about the world, but I've never been more excited about the possibilities. My personal objectives? <laughs> a big one is to stay healthy, and I try and work on that. Um, and we all, we all need to. Um, my brother just had a sort of catastrophic um, health experience and he survived it. But we've been talking a lot about our lifestyle and what we eat and so on. Um, I'm at that stage in my career where I'm successful professionally. I don't really need to work, but um, I want the smaller world that my children to inherit uh, to be a better one. And my generation has done a terrible job. And what we're leaving with, uh, leaving them with is a bit of a mess. So that's, my, that's what's really driving me right now. Um, I think that we are at a turning point where we need to rebuild, 
many of the industries and institutions that have served us well for decades or even centuries, but they, they're now stalled. They've taken us as far as they can on the old model, and they can't take us further. And, um, you know, my, my objective is to be as influential as I possibly can be in bringing about these changes to our cities, to our, our models of government, to our, um, our, our institutions for wealth creation and innovation. I think we need to rebuild our, our transportation system, our energy grid. We need to, we need to rebuild our models of, of health care and of science and of education and the university and so on. And um, for whatever reason, I seem to be in a situation where in a number of those I can be influential. So that's, that's what's driving me right now. Well, I would tell young people in general, and in Brazil in particular, um, be educated. Go to school and get lots of school. Study, study things that you have a passion for. Um, by all means, try and make yourself employable by studying things that are practical. But you know when you graduate, it's not really what you know that counts. It's your capacity to think to solve problem is, uh, problems, to learn lifelong, to put things in context. Th these are the kinds of things that are important. Um, and you're going to have to learn lifelong um, throughout your life. Uh, I would say uh, design your life. By designing your life, of course, I don't mean design every aspect, have the, uh, you know, 60-year a master plan because all kinds of things that will happen but what you want to do is is have a good brain have a good sen uh, sense of who you are some good principles and values so that you can live a life uh, of integrity and and to build uh, good relationships and to set the conditions whereby when chance comes along you can exploit it I mean what is luck luck is sort of the uh, the intersection of opportunity and preparation. And, uh, you know, I got lucky um, in the 1970s that got me into the whole world of the internet. But it was an opportunity that came along and I was prepared. I did actually have some passion and interest in the, in, in, in the background that enabled me to, uh, to get into this business. Um, live, aspire to live a life that's not only uh, prosperous, and you have a right to do that, but to live a life that's, that's principled and that's consequential. Um, by all means, go make lots of money and have a great family and career, but unfortunately for your generation, we need more from you than that. Um, the, the, my generation is leaving you with a very broken world, and it's gonna be up to you to fix it, and the stakes uh, are very, very high. Um, learn, learn from older people. Just because you're an authority on something really important doesn't mean that you're an authority on everything. And some things take experience to understand, like protecting your personal privacy. Um, don't give away everything on Facebook. You know, have a limited profile and make sure that, that your prospective employer can't use something you said or wore or drank or whatever. Um, as part of their reference uh, check. And when you come into the workforce, a lot of what you see you won't like. And you're probably right, because in your culture is the new culture of work. Don't get frustrated. Try and understand that, that this is the way it's been for a long time, and that you have a historic opportunity to, to bring about some change, but you're gonna have to work with others and other generations to overcome this sort of potential generational firewall that's shaping up in our institutions today. Vote, care, get involved in politics, try and make a difference outside uh, of your work, and, um, and have fun. It's never been a better time in history to have fun. That'd be my <laughs> quick summary of advice for, for a teenager. <laughs> Uh, my final thought is stay cool. <laughs> 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 <laughs>